after a somewhat lukewarm, not exactly disappointing reaction to the last episode, we're back with another tense episode, City of Fire. <laughs> kind of does what it says in the tin. I mean, this is an entire city in one building. This entire town block is one big city and one big shopping mall as well, so I guess it's a little bit, it may have been an inspiration for peach trees in Dread. Yeah, in the 2012 uh, Judge Dread adaptation, there's a massive mega city inside of one great big tower. Now, um, what happens here is, at, at the grand opening, I guess, of this big tower, one such family, a family of a mother, a father, and a small child, a little boy, go uh, walking around inside the garage, and they are left trapped in there when a massive fire breaks out after a car crashes in the basement, and um, the security automatically shut all of the doors, trapping them inside this already big labyrinth of a um, corridor maze. And so they're left in there as this f big fire is building and consuming the entire tower. The heat is tremendous, and so it's up to Thunderbirds to come and save them. Yes, I mean, this place isn't just a, uh, just a city in itself. Apparently it's the biggest shopping mall in the world, which is why this family really want to get there as soon as possible. I mean, apparently everything can be found, everything available in the world for purchase can be found in this 300-story building. So, can you imagine being a mall rat in that place? Snoochie boochies! <laughs> Another um, subplot, I guess, is that Brains is busy testing this new advanced cutting gas, which is supposed to be um, much more helpful than my, their lasers and um, all of that kind of equipment. But um, the only problem is, while Scott and Virgil are testing it out, it causes them to just pass out almost instantly. Um, and so when it comes down to like rescuing these people in the Thompson Tower, the only option they have is to use the gas, the experimental gas, because it's their only way for them to reach them in time. So the entire last act hinges on this tense rescue where you think at any moment the gas is just going to take effect and knock the Tracy brothers out while they're in the middle of trying to rescue these guys. Yeah, the intensity really gets to you and you see Virgil and Scott wading through all this smoke and flames. I mean, I think this is probably the one episode with the most fire in it. I mean. It'll certainly have pleased a young Ridley Scott about how much fire he likes to put in his films. Um, but I think that's the real science -y part of this, because, you know, you're using trial and error, and that's very scientific in the way you experiment with things, so it may have gone a bit wrong in the experimentation, but it certainly works, because Brains later explains that because of the extreme heat that uh, Scott and Virgil have been exposed to, that's why the gas hasn't affected them. They lucked out, but it was certainly one of the more heroic moments demonstrated by International Rescue, putting all their eggs into one basket, and um, gambling it all on an act of faith in order to save these people's lives. It's also very uh, claustrophobic as well, because it all takes place underground. You see the mole and the firefly being used again. Yeah, the return of those two classic pod vehicles, the mole and the firefly. Ah, the firefly. We should really do some firefly vlogs at some point. We loved firefly. <laughs> mm, awesome series. Um, what else can we talk about? Yeah, tremendous amount of um, pyrotechnic effects with the smoke and the fire. Uh, some heavy, almost creepy September 11th imagery with this giant building being on fire. Much like, um, you know, terror in New York City, obviously. <laughs> mm. um, we can also get to see the return of the hover bikes. Um, yeah. From, when was it, last episode? Uh, no, oh, that no, was a vault of death, death when they were in the, when they were in, in the underground. Mm. Um... Also, a little bit of um, sexism going on. Oh, God. With the, um, the, obviously, the fire is caused by a car crash. Um, <laughs> now, you're thinking, what kind of terrible, terrible driver would, would not think about slowing down when coming to the barriers and cause an entire fire at the bottom of this car park? Apparently, it's a female driver. Yes, Jerry Anderson seems to have a strong dislike of women drivers. I mean, it's even hinted at the end when Virgil asks Tintin about, was the driver male or female? Oh, I'm sorry, but I'm afraid it was female. Of course the driver was female. <laughs> right, so, full oh of death, we've got Lady Penelope being unable to drive Fab One without causing massive oh. road accidents and property damage. And now, we've got an entire building being burned down to the ground and putting loads of people in danger, all because a woman can't drive. Yeah, I mean, we're still gonna love, you know, this, this series and everything, but we just now can realise just how problematic <laughs> it was due to the 1960s politics used. Yeah, I mean, this was back when housewives were still very common, so I guess it's just the, um, yeah, it's just 
the well, age. I think the idea of how service common women have always worked. Let me tell you that. That's always a fact that no one really tells you. Mm. But I mean, we got this. Uh, we got another, uh, you know, little hint about uh, John again today because there's always John to talk about. Oh. I mean, I've done a bit of background reading about John and. There's two interesting things about him. The first is that John's puppet, his face, was modelled on Charlton Heston. So this was back in the heyday when Charlton Heston was in the likes of Ben-Hur, the Ten Commandments or so. And so apparently that's uh, why he looks so interesting. The, the blonde hair and the shape of the face. And also from uh, looking at his Wikipedia page, apparently he has like a PhD in astrophysics. Also, and you actually see what looks like this uh, degree certificate on the wall because he's in his uh, quarters at uh, Thunderbird Five. He's awaiting to be relieved, but unfortunately, the rescue happens. I can't help but feel less sorry for John Tracy, knowing that he's based on Charlton Heston. Yes, <laughs> big conservative gun nut. Wasn't even that great of an actor. A controversial opinion there, but come on. Well, I only really know he had a very good speaking voice, but uh, the good thing about John Tracy is he hardly ever uses his gun, so. From my cold, dead hand. And it's quite interesting. I mean, we've been saying how much, you know, how lonely he must get and how isolated he is because he really is just a call centre in space. But, I love uh, that scene, actually, where he is waiting to, for Alan to relieve him. Like, it's established that Alan's getting really taken back up and he's there with his suitcase. He's like, oh, I can't wait to get in that pool. It gets so lonely up there. And then a rare call comes in when he's got, like, an hour left to go back to Tracy Island and he's just like... Uh, here we go again. <laughs> Poor John. There Poor is John. at least one episode where he gets to come down and take part in an actual rescue, but for the most part, yeah, he's left doing fuck all because Jerry Anderson doesn't like him. I sure hope in the new one he's been given a bigger role. Mm, I think from the episodes I've seen, he takes more of a um okay, yeah, he doesn't necessarily take active part in the rescues, but he does more in Thunderbird 5, like he reroutes communications, he pulls up files for them to look at, and uh, he watches Stingray. Yeah. <laughs> Much better. That's a, we can love that. I mean, this uh, really is one of those uh, episodes where you see a lot of the Tracys in action and you see some new science being tested, so it's a real sci-fi episode because it's not just the, the technology but also the idea of basing an entire city in this one big s superstructure. It's a very dark episode as well. I mean, you really feel, really feel bad for this family but feel like they feel so helpless being left down there to die, they feel like nothing's happening. Even to the very end when the cutting laser comes through, the dad actually thinks that the fires reach them and he's really just left with giving up hope. You do feel bad for them, I mean, mainly because early on there's this scene where um, they have this little um, cops, they play cops and robbers with the kid in a quite charming but, you know, quite <laughs> typical scene, you know, in which, you know, you know they're going to get put in trouble for fucking around inside a room which they're not even supposed to be in. But well, Jerenson knows how to make likeable characters. That's one thing for certain about all of his creations. Mm. But I mean, these, this kind of family. This is the first time International Rescue have rescued a nuclear family unit. But this episode reminded me a lot of watching Casualty as a kid. You have these very normal people doing very normal things, and you're wondering who's going to get their head cut off. <laughs> Did people get their heads cut off no. a lot in Casualty? It just seems like oh yeah, oh Susan got her head cut off the last episode. Oh <laughs> again. <laughs> Because you just can't, you just don't know how gory it's going to get this time. You just wonder, I wonder what's going to happen to them. They're going to get their head cut off, their hands severed, or something. Or mm. who knows? Who knows? But that was City of Fire. Um, yeah, but certainly, you know, certainly a more tense episode than the last one. So um, I welcome that. And you know, despite a couple of somewhat misogynistic, inter you know, introductions, um, it's still a memorable episode nonetheless. Remember, if you know problematic media and you know you enjoy it, I mean. Don't always uh, say to yourself, oh, I'm not going to watch this anymore. It's always going to be about to raise the debate about things whenever people talk about it. Just say, I've noticed this, I've noticed this, let's talk about it this way. But yeah, you can still enjoy it for what it is. It's being media smart. Anyway, we'll see you for the next episode The Imposters. FAB. FAB.